please pray with me? Almighty God, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world. May your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, shine with the radiance of his glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, the reading I I want to focus on today is 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 to 20. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 to 20. Now, the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. Eli is the priest. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim, so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, Here I am. He ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew, because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He said, Here I am. Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, uh, we continue to be in the season of Epiphany. We've just started being in the season of Epiphany. We're the second, second week Uh, after the Epiphany. Uh, And this is a time when we consider how God has made himself known. Um, How has God made himself known to us as human beings? Uh, It's a time of revealing. So in our readings, we see the Epiphany of the priest uh, Eli as he realizes God is revealing himself to little Samuel. 
And uh, in our gospel reading for, for the Sunday, which I didn't read, uh, we also see the epiphany of Nathaniel as he realizes Jesus is the Messiah because he sees, uh, Jesus sees Nathaniel under the fig tree without being present. And so this is a common place for prayer and for study in hot weather. And so Jesus was uh, supernaturally able to have access to that information. And that gave a, a little bit of an epiphany to Nathaniel that this is not any ordinary rabbi. Um, our readings today are also marked by the theme of God's call. God called little Samuel into the life of a, being a prophet. And uh, in our gospel reading, which I didn't read, uh, Jesus calls Philip and Nathaniel to follow him. So there's this uh, revealing, but also this calling themes that are happening within the readings. The book of Judges is a book about the deterioration of God's people. So by the end of the book, they're in this deep, dark hole. And we're not sure how they're going to get out of this. Everything's a mess. And that's sort of what's what's in the air, what, that's the environment that Samuel is, is born into. Uh, the spiritual state of the people probably has something to do with why it says the word of the Lord was rare in those days, visions were not widespread. So the, the spiritual state of the people has gotten them in the way of them hearing from God. Um, it could be said that God wasn't active in communicating, but I suspect it's more likely that the people had become unable to hear God due to their spiritual state. We can get to a point where uh, we ignore God's direction so much that we just become unable to hear. And that's a, that's a scary state to sort of put ourselves into. Um, so it seems like the whole people of Israel seemed to be in this kind of a, a spiritual state. There are things we can do to make it hard for us to hear God's word. So uh, sin will make it hard for us to hear God's word to us. If we are unwilling to follow God's directions, that will also make it harder for us to hear, hear God. Um, we might also lead a life of distracted hurry where we rarely take time to be quiet, and that too will make it hard to hear God. So there are a number of ways in which we can make it harder to hear God. It, so it's during this dark time in Israel's history when we meet little Samuel. Um, he was placed into the care of the priest Eli by his parents, and he has been growing up, serving in the tabernacle there, being trained under the old priest Eli. And we read that the priest Eli was sleeping in his room near the tabernacle. And Samuel was sleeping in the tabernacle in the presence of the Ark of the Covenant, quite the place to sleep. <laughs> uh, and this is when Samuel hears the Lord call out to him. And this might be obvious, but it's worth pointing out that we have a God who communicates. Our Bible is full of descriptions of God communicating with his people. Uh, God communicates with all kinds of people in all kinds of ways throughout the scriptures. Our God wants to communicate with people. But it's, it's more than that. God wants to have a relationship with his people. He wants to partner with his people. So at this moment of darkness and transition in the, the time of Israel, during the time of the judges, God chooses a young boy to be his prophet. And I suspect that this has to do with the humility that Samuel represents. Uh, when asked who was the greatest in the kingdom of God, Jesus replies, whoever becomes humble like this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, it's from Matthew 18, verse 4. And so Samuel, as a child, represents humility, a humility that was maybe lacking in the rest of the, the people, or at least lacking in them as a, as a community. It's also important that there is at least some willingness to do what God is asking. And though those God communicates with are often full of hesitation, and that usually is connected with their humility. So Moses thinks God should pick someone else because he isn't a very good communicator. Um, so you can read about that in Exodus chapter 3. Uh, when the prophet Jeremiah is first called, he responds to God saying, I don't know how to speak. I am too young. You can read about that in Jeremiah chapter 1. And we see that this kind of reaction over and over um, 
We see this kind of reaction over and over when God speaks to people and asking them to, to do something for him or wanting to partner with them in something. Um, we often see people respond in this kind of a way, like maybe I'm not the right person to do this with you. But they eventually overcome their initial hesitation to do what God is asking them to do. Um, so an openness to do what God is asking them to do seems like an important part of this. If God knew that there was no chance of partnering with a person to do the task, like he knew that the person was just that stubborn, that even if he talks to them, directly, that they are not going to respond, they're not going to do what he's asking them to do, then why would God communicate with that person? You know, I remember I had a friend one time who uh, I asked him, you know, what would it take for God? He, you know, he didn't really believe. And so I asked him, what would it take for God to, to, to talk to you? Like, what, what would make you believe? And I, I remember asking him, what if like the, the roof blew open right now and an angel came down and spoke to you right in front of your eyes. And he said, well, I'd probably think I was hallucinating, right? So, he, so when you have somebody who is that unwilling to uh, hear God, then you can imagine God being like, well, what's the point in speaking to this person? They're, they're, there's no way they're going to change their mind. They're that stubborn, and God knows how stubborn we can be. He, he knows um, what his communication is going to do. Um, so anyway... Um, there has to be some willingness to do what God is asking, I think, for us to be able to hear God accurately. So an openness to doing, to, uh, openness to obedience. So humility and obedience to God, uh, to God's will, seems to be important elements in being able to hear God. And maybe even a, um, whether God's speaking to us um, Maybe those elements are important as well. And per perhaps this is why Jesus chose fishermen rather than religion scholars when he, he's calling his disciples. Um, they were teachable. They were people of action. They knew what it was like to get their hands dirty. Little Samuel is sleeping when he hears a voice call to him, and twice he thinks it's the old priest Eli calling to him. So to Samuel, the voice he heard seemed familiar. I think this is interesting. It was so familiar to him that he thought it was the voice of a man who was a father to him. He had grown up with, with Eli since he was little. And so he heard a voice that sounded familiar like his father's voice. And so he ran to, to Eli. God's voice also called him by name. God didn't call into the crowd saying, can anyone hear me, <laughs> right? God's not generally saying, can anyone hear me? Can anyone hear me? I need a volunteer. He, he's, he's not doing that and waiting for someone to respond. And God didn't say, hey, you boy. God said, Samuel, right? So, no, so God is really personal here. God knows us intimately. Our, our psalm that is assigned for, for, for today it also speaks about knowing God intimately. And I, I didn't read that, but Psalm 139 is very much about God knowing us intimately. We read there, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. So God speaks as someone who knows you because he does. God does know you. Samuel doesn't seem frightened. He doesn't seem, dis seem disturbed by this, by this voice. And to me, that says that there has to be a kind of warmth to the voice. There has to be a kind of familiarity to the voice. There's also a persistence to God's voice. God didn't just call out once and then give up. God gave Samuel time to figure out what was going on. So he kept calling. Um, but notice how important Eli's guidance is here. So Eli is the priest that's, he's the one caring for Samuel. What if Eli told the boy that he was just dreaming, go back to bed? Um, so the guidance of Eli is crucial for Samuel hearing God, for interpreting what was happening to him properly. This required wisdom on Eli's part. People do sometimes have crazy dreams. And people can hear voices and experience hallucinations. By the time, the third time 
that Samuel came to him, Eli realized what was really going on. And so he gave him guidance. Um, he discerned what was happening. Go lie down, he says, and if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Eli correctly figures out what's going on here. Samuel then follows Eli's direction and hears a message from God. But it isn't a pleasant message. Part of hearing God is being willing to do the difficult thing that God is, is asking. God gave a message that Eli's irreverent and hypocritical sons would be removed from service as priests. And understandably, Samuel doesn't want to share what God said to him, but Eli insists, and so he does eventually share. Um, I think this is another aspect of the story that we don't want to miss. A prophet who has to share difficult news finds it painful to do so. They're not doing so happily. Samuel wasn't happy about sharing this news. Um, Eli essentially had a pride out of him. The prophet Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. He loved his people, but he saw the terrible things that were going to happen to them as consequences of their choices, uh, or the choices of the leadership. So true prophets were willing to speak the hard words of necessary correction. And they were hard words to speak, just as they were hard words to hear. So if someone comes gleefully sharing words of judgment, we should be very suspicious. That is, that is not, um, does, that doesn't strike me as the way that I, I hear the prophets delivering hard news. Um, I think that Samuel was called to a very specific ministry as God's prophet, and so he heard God in a very specific way that was, um, that was part of his calling as a prophet. I also believe that God speaks to people now. Um, generally, God probably won't make a point of communicating something to us that is uh, plainly a part of the overall message of the scriptures. So I suspect God isn't going to wake us up in the middle of the night and tell us, don't murder. Murder is wrong. <laughs> but he's not going to tell us something that should be plainly known in the scriptures. Yeah. So that's something that we should generally know by, by studying the Bible. Generally, when we take scripture as a whole, as a, you know, taking into account the part of the story that each piece of scripture is in, um, the principle, there's principles we can derive from it. And this is especially true for us as Christians because we're also reading it through the person of Jesus Christ. So when we do that, we read the whole of the scriptures, reading it in the story, in the part of the story that's appropriate to it, um, and reading it through the person of Jesus, then we get a really good general sense of God's general direction for us as human beings, how we are to live. Knowing the scriptures in this way is also important for discerning God's voice when he speaks to us in a more specific and individual way. So there's a general way that he lets us know who he is, what he's about, the direct general direction of humanity, which is, uh, we can find that in scripture. God, God doesn't have to communicate specifically to us about those things. He's not gonna wake us up in the middle of the night to tell us the 10 commandments. But the more specific, uh, there's a more specific way of communicating. And knowing scripture is important for discerning God's voice when he speaks to us in, in a more specific and individual way. We do have to know the scriptures. God's voice is going to be consistent with who Jesus is as the incarnate word of God. The general principles we can derive from the scriptures aren't going to tell us if, if we should get married or which individual we should get married to. The general scriptures are not going to tell us that. The principles we derive from scripture are not going to tell us that. They'll tell us something about marriage, but they're not going to tell us if we as individuals should get married or which individual we should get married to. The general principles we find in the scriptures won't tell us what job we should get or what city we should live in. These are more specific issues that we can ask God about. 
Uh, and I suspect that there are issues where God may just want us to choose as a part of our spiritual maturity. God will sometimes give us specific direction, and this can be very subtle. We might not always recognize that God has given us direction. Um, I think the main way that we hear God personally is through an inner impression or in our inner thought life. An inner impression is something like the feeling of conscience. That's the way we often describe it. When you are about to do something that you know is wrong, and you have an inner discomfort about that, that's what we call our conscience. And we can numb that over time if we try to, to drown that out by just pushing through and doing the wrong thing that we know we shouldn't be doing. Eventually our conscience will change and so, such that we don't sort of get that anymore. Um, or maybe when you know you should do something for someone and you have a kind of an inner pressure, um, that, that kind of conscience feeling, or that's the way we normally describe it, is as, as our conscience is telling us something. That's sometimes the way that God speaks to us, is through that inner impression, that kind of an inner pressure uh, to do something or to st not do something that can, that can be present to us. Um, sometimes it can just be a sort of an inner warning about something. Uh, there's lots of people who have experiences of, of uh, I chose not to go down that road, and then it ended up that it was a good thing they didn't go down that road. Similarly, you will sometimes have thoughts that enter your mind. Um, so God doesn't have to use vibration of air to create sound that then stimulates our eardrums to communicate uh, an idea into our minds, right? God can just insert a thought directly into our mind. And that doesn't mean that every thought that we have is from God. These are things that, that need to be discerned very carefully. And I have to admit that it isn't always easy to discern between my thoughts and God's voice. So this isn't a, don't, I don't want to pretend like this is a clear thing or an easy thing. Though sometimes it can become very clear in certain specific instances. So we should not be surprised that God communicates with us. That is the God that we read about in Scripture. Jesus is God with us. And surely communication is a part of why God came to be with us as Jesus. We should expect that God wants to communicate with us. We should also beware of saying things like, who am I that God would speak to me? Because the people that God speaks to in the Bible have that same kind of reaction. <laughs> Who am I that God would speak to me? God spoke to a little boy, not the priest, not the, the priest who had lots of experience under his belt, who is taking care of the Ark of the Covenant. God didn't speak to him. He spoke to the little boy. Jesus didn't call famous religion scholars when he was looking for disciples to follow him. Right? So maybe our hearing him has to do with our ability to listen, our humility, and not God's desire to speak to us. I believe God is wanting to speak to us. But sometimes we are too distracted. Sometimes we um, lack humility And so maybe as we approach God, um, we can do so with uh, an, a willingness to obey and with increased humility so that we can, we can hear from him better. And also, you know, just spend more time in silence. <laughs> um, hearing is always easier when we have time in solitude and silence. Right. Amen. Thank you.